What's up guys and welcome back to Monique. If you guys are new here then what is up? My name is Erica Heya. How you doing? And if you're into the history of the ancient Greeks and the Romans, maybe you're just into the mythology and maybe, you know what? Maybe you just kind of like Hades and Persephone and you're just like, screw it, I'm now a classist because I enjoy these two gods. Well then this is the place for you. Okay, you guys are gonna wanna hit that subscribe button and that bell icon so that you know every single time I post in the future. But as you can see from the title of today's video, it's not going to just be me blathering. In fact, I will be bringing on a guest today, a returning guest at that, which is super exciting. I'm always shocked that people want to come back on the channel and talk to me after I just like yammer for like 25 minutes. But it's great. I'm super excited because today we're going to be bringing on the author of recently released A Touch of Malice, Scarlet St. Clair. So I'm super excited to have Scarlet on the channel because as you can see, I have lots of mythology questions for this lady to answer. I also have some key scenes on the side which I want to discuss with her. Oh, there's gonna be a lot of editing involved in this chat, I just know it. So um, I'm sorry that I'm probably gonna to have to cut a lot out. So A Touch of Malice is the third book in the Hades and Persephone trilogy. It's technically the fourth, but it's the third book from Persephone's point of view. Because for those of you who don't know, Scarlet has written two series that are part of the same series, if that makes sense. So any book starting with A Touch of is from Persephone's point of view, and any book starting with A Game of is from Hades' point of view. Same story, two different perspectives. I personally love it. I think that's such a brilliant idea. I've already basically just told her that she's a genius on camera. You guys can check out that episode beforehand. But A Touch of Malice just continues that storyline. So I'm not really gonna be going into the story itself because it's kind of, like if you haven't read the other two, a, a Touch of Darkness and A Touch of Ruin, then me explaining what this book is about will not make any sense. So I highly suggest that you just basically, I'm just gonna leave some reviews in the description below. Highly suggest that you check those out if you're thinking about buying it after reading the previous two. But if you haven't read the previous two, read the previous two because you, you just can't pick up this, it just wouldn't make any sense. Now before I go ring Scarlet and rack her brain for all of these questions, by the way, I cannot promise that it's gonna be spoiler free. I will be including some text now because I'll be editing this obviously after I do the interview to let you know how many spoilers are in it and if you should keep watching. But before I go and do that, I have some super exciting news for you guys. And that is that Moan will be doing its first ever giveaway. Ah! So the giveaway today will consist of three different little gifts for you guys. The first two will be scented candles from Scarlet St. Clair's online shop. Both of us uh, decided which ones that we would want to gift you guys, which ones that we thought were like the funnest to do, uh, the most different to do, and also the ones that aren't really getting a lot of love because everybody just wants Hades and Persephone plastered to their chest or just like whatever it is. So we wanted to give these candles a little bit of love and give you guys those. And also, obviously, I'll be giving you one of her books. And we decided together to give you a signed copy of A Game of Fate. Now, why did we decide to do that considering today we're talking about A Touch of Malice? The reason why we decided for A Game of Fate is because the next book that she will be publishing, that Scarlet will be publishing, will be A Game of Retribution. So it'll be the second book in the Hades line of the story. So, for those of you who haven't read it, or if you have and, and you just haven't had a signed copy, then now is your chance to enter the giveaway and to get a signed copy of A Game of Fate. Now, there are a couple of rules, obviously, in entering this giveaway. The first one is that you must be following Moan Inc. and Scarlet St. Clair on Instagram. So you must go and do that first and foremost. After you've done that, then please screenshot yourself watching this video at any point throughout, or you can do a little screen recording, whatever it is you wanna do, and post it on your story and tag both Scarlett and I in the story. That's basically it, okay? It's super quick, super simple. The last thing you will have to do though is go and like this post that I just posted on Moan Inc's account. Also, anybody who immediately unfollows us after the closing date, which is June 25th, then uh, you will immediately be disqualified. So you're not gonna wanna do that if you really do wanna win this little prize. Totally free, once again, it's just, we're just gonna send it to you because we wanna spread the Hades and Persephone love. Check all of the details in the description below and in this post that I posted on Moan. I think I just included everything. Yeah. I'm gonna go call Scarlet and we're gonna get to some mythology chat. So welcome back to the channel, Scarlett. Thank you so much for coming back on. Oh my God. Hi, I am very excited to be here. <laughs> so the first thing we have to talk about because people who watch my channel know I hate Theseus. I don't keep it a secret. I hate the man. I think he is genuinely a danger to society. And you wrote him perfectly, in my opinion, in A Touch of Malice. Like I completely agreed with how you portrayed Theseus's character. You did not hold back. You did not make him like kind of a nice guy. You know, like you just went full throttle. So what mythology did you use to paint Theseus in the way that he is in the book? 
Uh, well, you know, Theseus, um, he's just like the ultimate bro. <laughs> and he, I knew that obviously um, he and Herathus had decided that they wanted to marry daughters of Zeus and, you know, they kidnapped Helen and then went into the underworld and got trapped and all that. Um, but on top of that, he had kind of, I felt like he had this vigilante justice thing going on where he would go into towns and like murder men who were thieves and um and i don't know or i don't know i just thought that was very i don't know presumptuous of him like uh i think some people would look at that as heroic but um i was like well that could apply in modern day where he thinks that he is you know, the ultimate, like, heroic good guy, like, I'm going to be the ultimate, like, new god, and, and I just felt like those things were kind of sleazy, but then also with, you know, the Minotaur, which is what he's most, I guess, I felt like most known for, um, I mean, he cheats his way with Ariadne, he cheats, you know, with kind of manipulating, I feel, Ariadne, into assisting him um he cheats his way like out of the labyrinth kills the minotaur and then he just like up and leaves her we don't really know like but i think that he abandoned her after her use was you know was she was she is no longer useful to him <clears throat> so to me these were all signs that pointed to him being a terrible person <laughs> and uh but i do have one reader who thinks that he has a redemption arc and i was like no like i'm telling you right now like there's no redemption arc for for theseus but i did feel like if he was a person who existed in modern day he would be this person who wanted to you know eke out vigilante justice and um he the thing that i liked about his character which is a horrible thing to like but he doesn't hesitate to act out his um threats he just does it and um i felt like that's what theseus did throughout all of the mythology is um just make a decision and you know to kill those people and then he 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 and other people uh tend to justify his actions I mean, I agree. And I say that constantly, constantly, like literally all the points you just said, like I have said a hundred thousand times where I'm like, <laughs> what, what kind of a man thinks it's okay to just roll up to these towns and just kill randos that he doesn't know. Like he just literally does that with his various mates throughout mythology, not just like all the time. He then picks up Helen. Like you said, people forget that part of the myth. I know, I know. She was taken to Troy. Theseus picked her up because he thought she was hot. And I'm like, you can't just, who gave you permission? What? Along with Theseus, who's a new addition to the book and the series, we have loads of new gods who are mentioned. I let you have a list, everybody, because otherwise I would have forgotten. You mentioned Harmonia, Tyche, Hypnos, Pan, Oceanus, Zephyrus, Ceto, which shocked me, by the way, because no one knows that Ceto exists apart from like, the nerdiest of nerds because we have to read like <laughs> he see it a hundred thousand times at university so we know that she exists but no one else cares about her and yet she's in the book i was like oh hello there you are <laughs> so what made you include all of these new gods and why did you feel like it was important that people knew who they were kind of various reasons I of course, I'll start with, I can start a little bit with Sito, but she's uh, the goddess of sea monsters. And um, I just thought, <sighs> I felt like all of these gods, all of the, the monsters, uh, they're trapped in the underworld. And um, some of them probably are useful in helping defend the underworld. And so I wanted a representation of, since we did see the other monsters um, in the underworld in this book, I wanted a representation of a goddess who was also a sea monster, I guess, also a monster. Um, but I also felt like she, I was really trying to find someone who could go up against Demeter and I felt like she was a good option. Harmonia, I had always known that Harmonia was going to be in this book and I can't tell you why. I just really loved the idea of folding her in. I needed someone to who um, Aphrodite could be invested in. And um, in some mythology, she is the daughter of Ares and um, Aphrodite, but obviously uh, she, sometimes she is also the daughter of Zeus. So I made her into Aphrodite's sister. So I, and I really felt like she, um, I don't know, her character just spoke to me in a different way. She just seemed really calm. She seemed like a huge, a really nice balance 
to every all the other insanity that was going on. Uh, also, really nice balance for Sybil um, because I and I like the idea that um, I feel like Harmonia is kind of I don't know maybe Pan. She's I like to have a lot of LGBTQ plus representation in my books and. And I thought it would be interesting to go with the storyline of Sybil not really, um, not really ever thinking that she would be interested in females, but finding out that she is. Let's talk about Hecuba because you literally just throw in a name and they move on. And I was like, hold up, <laughs> I know who that is. And it's really funny because you drop her in quite early on. You just drop in Hecuba, and then like three chapters later we meet Hector and uh, Ajax, who are from the Trojan War. Hector's on the Trojan side, Ajax is on the Greek side, and you have Apollo sort of like, like not really understanding who he fancies because he feels like he's aligned to one of them and then he fancies the other one and they end up fighting. Oh, it's a whole thing. But I really liked the references to the Trojan War, not only for the war that you're building up to, but also for the fact that Apollo is so confused as to whose side he's on. <laughs> But I'm not was... confused in actual mythology. Like... <laughs> well, in mythology, for everyone who doesn't know, he sends a plague to the Greek camp. He's like, you guys, like, I I'm not happy with you. But in yours, it's just like, he's struggling, not because he believes in them, but because he doesn't know who's hotter. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, but to be fair, he does really, <laughs> he really, really likes Ajax. <laughs> I love Ajax. And Hector, I love that dynamic. Um, but one of the things I really wanted to do, I don't know why I felt like Ajax was going to be death. Uh, but I just thought it would be really cool to have this colossal man who is very strong and um, and also maintain those mortal strengths, but also be death. And I know in mythology, like I obviously had Hector be Apollo's like champion, but um, in that, I mean, he is, on the side of Hector in that in that myth, um, but still, for some reason, like Ajax. I don't know. I just wanted to tap it. <laughs> to be fair, I think everyone fancies Ajax though. Like Ajax in the Iliad is constantly described as like a tower, and I think it's really hot when I'm reading it. And it's like he's strolling, and I'm like, yes, big Ajax, do your thing. <laughs> I don't know. I had a lot of fun with that. So, even though even though I thought in reality, like, I don't know if this would ever be a thing. I did play with the idea also of not bringing them into the future, into the modern era, like Ajax and Hector and changing their names. But they're very iconic characters and they have a history already. Uh, so I, they have a history of like bumping heads already. So I just kind of took it and made it a lover's quarrel, <laughs> which I hope doesn't like diminish the importance of their roles in mythology. Um, but hopefully we get to see them more in uh, chaos and, and see the, their, their true natures come to light. But yeah, it was, a, it was a really hard to introduce them because I felt like in Malice, I had so many new characters and this is still Persephone's story. So how in the world do you do that, you know? And I don't know. I mean, I thought that they were done well though because it wasn't ancient times. Because you brought them into this dystopian world, it was fine. And that's something, as I said before we started recording, it's something that my friend and I said in another episode, that it's, if you're gonna take these people out of the ancient context, you can do whatever the hell you want with them. Like, as long as it's not, you didn't write the book set in the Trojan War and they're both in their camps, like fancying each other, then I would have been like, you're kind of pushing it. But it's in a whole new world. Like, why wouldn't when they? they wanted to kill each other. <laughs> yeah, it's like Ajax is deaf. I was like, okay, Ajax is deaf now. Like, probably deaf because of the Trojan War. That makes sense. Moving on. Like, you know? <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, that was, it was just, it's so difficult to balance that. And I never know, like, what to leave. What do you leave in ancient times? You know, what do you, leave, what do you bring forward? Is this going to make sense? Like, I hope no one ever asks me. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I hope no one says, so what is, how, what, how does all this stuff change? What happens in ancient Greece? And I'm just going to be like, I don't know. It, it, it doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> I, I think it's a, it's a really great experiment in how society doesn't change in a lot of ways, because uh, obviously we talked about this before, but Apollo and his, the way that he relentlessly chases women, you know, um, and everyone still loves him. He's like the golden boy. Right. And, and I just think that that has not changed, unfortunately, 
so the way that we sort of ev- all the women in Greek mythology, even when they have even as goddesses, are victims. I mean, we we just have not changed, and um, so I think writing this in modern times really illustrates how we don't change as a, as a society. But also on the topic of women coming into the forefront, um, you mentioned Hestia as an Olympian, which I am a hoe for Hestia. She is my favorite. <laughs> like, yeah, she's the only one who makes sense. She's so underrated as a goddess. I think she is just, like you said, she makes perfect sense. She's the goddess of the hearth and the home. Why wouldn't she be an Olympian? She's also like literally siblings with the big three, with Hera, like she's the only one of those six who's not an Olympian. And you're like, rude, what? Excuse you. Um, but along with Hestia being an Olympian, you then also made uh, Hades an Olympian as well. But then you demoted Hephaestus, which was a little bit sad, um, which is fine. Once I love him. <laughs> this is your new world. So there are no rules. The, like you create the rules. But I'm curious as to why not Hades, because I kind of understand why you did Hades. Like it's very tough to explain. Like he didn't live on Olympus. He's not an Olympian. So sorry, he's not involved in any of these parties. But Hephaestus being demoted and Hestia being promoted. I'm curious as to why that change happened. I feel like Hephaestus is someone who is used quite a bit as an errand boy, like make these things for us. But I also didn't feel like he, uh, not that he wouldn't value a seat there. I He just felt so quiet to me and so interested in like, I mean, at one point he makes these mechanical bees to try and combat the, like, the issue of pollinization and um, a lack of food. And he's questioning whether or not he should do that because Demeter is the goddess of, you know, uh, the harvest. And will she be angry? But he knows that sh- how she acts with, like, the winter storm. So, so he's kind of very scientific and very quiet. But Hestia, I felt like, is the voice of reason even when she even in on olympia where they're meeting she is saying like you have to do something about the storm and everyone's like oh leave it and that's true to myth you know where where they don't pursue demeter i mean they don't try to stop her drought they just let it go and zeus sends people to say hey come back come back to olympus you know it'll be great and until it's way too late, until people start dying and their worshipers are, you know, fewer and fewer, that's when Zeus intervenes. But I felt like Hestia is someone who's not going to participate in a battle that is, well, dumb. <laughs> like, you know, you should be gods. Like, that's her viewpoint. Um, so, I, yeah, I just never quite understood for my, like, from my point of view, um, why Hephaestus over Hestia because I just didn't get it and so (laughs) so I moved that and um I also like the I just I don't know I liked the dynamic of Aphrodite being the Olympian and Hephaestus not being the Olympian and um and I think he is in the books okay with that I just I I don't know I just really felt like from my point of view I'm like that's a weird choice Greek mythology why did you choose that? Why did you choose that? Um, so, and I did feel also that if I did not make Hades, I will say an Olympian, people would be very confused because there's a lot of false information out there that does list Hades as an Olympian and he's not. Um, so I did feel like if I could, and it makes sense. Yeah, he's one of the three, like he's one of, one of the three who drew lots. But yeah. I just, I don't know. I like, I'm like you. I really love Hestia. I love that when it came to the battle at the end of the book, she was like, I'm out of this. Like, this is ridiculous, you know? And her and Athena are the only two who are like, this will serve no purpose. And everyone else is just angry and power hungry. But that's what makes Hestia the best because she's not thinking about like, what will give me more power? She's just thinking about like, what's going to protect people. And that's what a goddess should do. But with specific gods, there's actually a quote that I want to mention that you wrote, which I was obsessed with from the minute that you wrote it. I was like, this is so important. So the quote is on page 17. If there are people watching who have their books, pick up your books, people. So it's on page 17. It says marriage between gods is not like mortals. Gods share power and they have children. 
And that to me is one of the most, if not the most important mythology quote that you gave in all of Malice, because I think that a lot of people get the wrong idea about Greek gods, where they're like, oh, it's incestuous and it's really gross. But the Greeks had to explain everything with a deity. And a lot of these things are similar. So how do you explain something that's similar to one entity and to another entity? It must be a kid. It, it must have been. So that quote was so classically important in your book. And I'm wondering what made you write that? Like what made you be like, that has to be in there. People need to know this. I feel like all of these unions produced something that at some point was almost detrimental to the society. Um, and now that I've said that out loud, I'm like, give examples. <laughs> so I was thinking in terms of like, when, when gods marry, they produce these children who go out into the world and some of them create havoc. Like, look, I mean, it, I guess it's Eros. not even like, that's a good example. Yes. <laughs> I'm like, who is this? <laughs> I don't remember anything. I don't remember. But I was trying to apply that to modern times. And if you have new marriages between like Hades and Persephone, for instance, who, what kind of God is that going to produce? And Persephone didn't have, we don't actually have a lot of mythology on Hades and Persephone. Um, I take a lot of liberties uh, involving them and other myth myths in this world because I feel like they somehow like, like they would be I don't know especially it has anything to do with death and she so I have her being a, a lot more powerful because of that and because of being bringing her into the modern times so it's like if those two gods combine powers it's going to produce something that is pretty potentially detrimental to other gods or the world um so part of it was just like a reasoning of seeing just like a pattern over myth and bringing that into modern times well with uh, all of this other mythology that you've woven into it i mean there's such a long list of other myths that are not god oriented that you throw into malice which is just crazy you have arachne also hephaestus's net which you reference which is for us nerds uh there's a massive story about hephaestus net when he catches Ares and aphrodite hooking up in the odyssey and he catches them in this magical net. So then they're like stranded over the bed and all the other Olympians come in and they laugh. Um, that is a legitimate myth, by the way, people who are watching. There's also the labyrinth at the end of it, which is reference, which is Theseus, but not godly mythology. Hyacinth as well, who you have a novella coming out about. The Hydra, who's down in Tartarus, where they walk past her cell. So you've got the Hydra, Prometheus. I mean, I could literally go on and on and on about all of the people that you mentioned, as well as you even have Apollo and Daphne, like you said previously, which is not, you don't even mention Daphne, but you, it's like Apollo just says, um, the last time I chased someone, they begged to be turned into a tree. And I was like, brilliant. There it is. <laughs> so That's good. A reference from Ruin too, where um, I do talk about that myth specifically, but um, yeah, lots of, lots of, there's so much in there and like, it's kind of the same question as the one before with the gods that it's like, how did you, like, okay, I'm a classicist, right? I'm not creative, okay? What I do is just read things and then regurgitate them and then maybe analyze the words occasionally where I'm like, funny, this could be translated in this way. But, so I don't understand how you have slotted in so many myth references that make sense as well, that make logical sense where they go. Like, I don't know how your brain was like, oh, this is where the puzzle piece goes. So sometimes this is interesting because sometimes it's hard for me to answer questions because I have retained so much knowledge over time about these myths that I forget why I have it in my head. And then it comes out when I'm writing. Um, and these are sort of examples of that where um, some of it, especially like the monsters, Arachne, uh, the Hydra, like those are all things that came up for me as I was writing. And I was like, I can fold these into, into this space to flesh out the world. Um, but then other things, like I always knew the labyrinth would have to be a part of the story because I was using Theseus as the myth as one of the main villains and uh, a thread of mythology. So the main threads I try to, the main threads of the myth I take from, I try to stay true to in a lot of ways. And then the smaller things, like a lot of the monsters, um, I want to throw in. But I'll tell you also, I try to lay that foundation because I know that in 
for instance, retribution, um, the monsters will come up again. But specifically, I am almost certain I'm going to reference, I don't remember how to say the name. During Titan Alchemy, the Titans learn about the monsters intestines that they can burn and that is supposed to give them the power to overthrow the olympians but they're unable to do that because that monster is slain and i plan to bring that monster into that book so i can lay the foundation where this isn't surprising or like this didn't come out of late left field um so in knowing that i'm going to do that um i kind of just throw it in there it's really weird. Sometimes I hate it because I want to sound more knowledgeable. I'm like, oh yeah, blah, blah, blah. I read all these, but I did, I did read all these things. I just retain the information and then fold it in as I go. And then I can't quote it. Like, you, like you're brilliant. You can like quote it and be like, that's from blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, the, the, the hard part came with trying to figure out how a God would die. Like the net. Mm. I was like, how would you, if you're a lesser God, you could be trapped, which is why they chose to go with Har Harmonia at first and Taiki, but how, how do you kill an actual God? And so, um, and how do you trap a God? Hades, how do you trap Hades? So I had, I brought in the net a few times because I felt like that trapped a God. Did it trap too, so. Yeah, it did. And I get really real, like I get really real about that stuff. Like I keep myself from doing stuff because I think this is a God. How do gods fight? Like how does a God defeat another God? How do you kill a God? Like, I don't know because I mean, even the Titans, people were asking me, because I have the mythology that when someone dies, they, when a god dies, they don't go, they don't go to the underworld with their powers. Um, so someone was like, well, what about the Titans? I'm like, well, the Titans were trapped. They're not dead. So that's, they wouldn't, they would still retain their powers, but they wouldn't be able to use them while, while they're trapped in adamantine in the underworld. So I have to have all these answers because I'm going to be asked. <laughs> But I don't know. I guess you can kind of see how my brain is working through it. Like even now, like that's how I think through things. Well, with your books, they're all mythology mostly. And most people are going to associate them with mythology as we've literally harped on this entire time. But you also have a lot of history in there. Like we mentioned the Trojan War. And one of the main things in this book is chariot racing, like we talked about last time. So what was the research process like for the chariot racing? Because you have the amount of teams in there. You've got the crowd in there. You've got you know, the, the laps numbers, you've got the, the dolphins or the eggs. Which one did you use actually? The dolphins or the eggs? I can't remember. I think I chose the dolphins because I knew it was, um, they were easier to describe. Well, also the eggs are really weird and they then were scrapped because even the ancients were like, this is bizarre. Why yeah. are you using eggs? <laughs> uh, yeah. So even they were like, the dolphins are prettier. We'll just use those. Um, so, you know, you have all of that stuff in there. So yeah, what was that like? What was that whole research process like? And because I can't imagine it's going to be easy. Like I did it in school, which is f spanned years of me understanding chariot racing and then visiting the sites. I will include all of my photos because I love doing that. But I visited all of it and understood it. So how did you, I don't, I don't know how you managed to do it. Well, I wish I could have vis visited something in person because I remember reading about it and it was the most confusing thing I had ever read in my entire life. I did not understand this, uh, the spine, the spinel. I can't even remember. Yeah. What is it <laughs> that I did not, I was like, what is your purpose? And like, it never fully described sort of what was in the center of it, but, but that these, the chariots raced around it. And, uh, then I also didn't know like where strategically is it, the, is it important to have your chariot and how, you know what I mean? Because like you have to make a turn with a four horse chariot and that's a bizarre. And, um, I don't know, there was just so much of it that I didn't understand, but I, I found some really good, um, historical websites that were very thorough in talking through every aspect of it. Um, and then I needed to see a visual. So we talked before about that, the movie Ben Hur, Ben Hur, Ben mm -hmm. it. Um, and they have so many great visuals and it was so interesting, but you have to watch the old one because the new one does not do justice to just how intense I feel like chariot racing was because it was super dangerous. Um, and like, I don't know, I just loved the attention to detail in Ben Hur and everything that I saw in that those clips was reflected in the research I had done. So I knew that that was the most accurate. And um, and I, anytime I do that, do something like that, 
I like to lay the foundation with the verbiage that I find um, when I research and then what I, why I need the visual is so I can feel how it's supposed to feel. And um, that is why, so I kind of combine those two things. But the visual element was really important because I didn't feel like I was quite getting it. It was really hard. <laughs> it was so hard. In fact, I remember our last chat, I was in the middle of researching chariot races and I thought I will never be able to write this and I will never be, I will, this will not make any sense when I do, when I write this, because I don't know what I'm reading <laughs> because there were so many elements to it. And I couldn't envision what the arena looked like because it was just, I don't know. It, it was just really difficult. But, um, so I did a lot of research on what old, what old arenas looked like and like what, um, my favorite thing ever is, uh, well, kind of related. I love when they try to rebuild or kind of give you a model of what these ancient sites looked like because it's very helpful for your brain because otherwise, for instance, in, in Greece, you will just assume that everything is white and marble, but it's actually very colorful. Um, and you, we know that because, well, like Pompeii, for example, the walls are very colorful and the tile is very colorful. Um, but if you don't have sort of those reconstructions, you don't, you don't know what, how vibrant world really was and I kind of felt like that with um chariot racing I mean because once again though I think you know the, the fact that you brought everything into your own world gives you a lot more liberty so I'm not reading it as like I'm gonna analyze the crap out of this because what if she didn't include this statue of Poseidon in the middle of this thing or what you know like things like that it's like so I tried to I tried to research what was in the middle of the arena and I just made up my own because Apollo is like, I have him as like the chancellor of the games because like he's athletic, he's, you know. And um, so I was like, oh, he'll just put his own people in the middle <laughs> of this thing. Which one um, works actually, for your world? Yeah, I actually couldn't f figure out or find what they put in the middle. They just were like statues and things. So usually it's going to so be- So do you know? Yeah, it's going to be, <laughs> it's going to be Poseidon. He's also the god of forces. So he's in there. And then in Rome, it's Neptune, <laughs> who's always in the middle, just because they are the god of horses. So people are like, hey, protect us, which obviously doesn't help when you're doing chariot racing. And I feel like it's easier to learn about chariot racing when you've seen the arenas. Like I found that that really helped me contextually. Like when I went to Rome and I saw the Circus Maximus, which is basically a dog park now, which is really sad, but understanding the space it was, so I could see how large the park was that I was like, okay, it makes sense that this then would have, you know, 250,000 seats. That's how many seats were in that one place. And then underneath it were bars. Like, but seeing the space that existed in made way more sense. Well, going to Delphi, they have a stadium at the top of the site of Delphi. And to see the size of that, I was like, ah, okay, this now, it makes sense. But you're right, like reading about those things when we don't have that sport now is very difficult to then try and visualize it ourselves or the, t the terminology too if you aren't familiar with even horses <laughs> like that is it's really difficult to you wrote something that i literally was like this is amazing not in a, a classical sense but oh maybe if i ever find it again but i did tab all it. your tabs i know there are too many I feel like at the end of this, you're not gonna, there's nothing I say is gonna be useful for your YouTube video. <laughs> I'm true, the majority of it is, but okay, well I can't find, there is a tab in there where I literally, and it's something that Hermes says, he says something about grief, but. but oh yeah, he says that it's something about at the end of the day. If... Ah, I found it. He says, no one ever said you had to pretend everything was okay, Hermes said. Grief means we loved fiercely. And if that is all anyone ever has to say about either one of us in the end, I think we lived our best life. I loved that. It has nothing to do with classics, but I was like, oh. I know, I know. I wrote that book. I wrote Malice while, um, you know, in the, mid in the middle of grieving my father's death. And I mean, I'm still grieving my father's death. It was six months when, the, when Malice came out uh, that I had lost him. And uh, so, yeah, I, <laughs> a lot of those themes carry over, but I do think, you know, death is such a huge part of any culture and especially for the Greeks as well. I mean, we have Hades who um, is not necessarily seen as a good uh, character, like a good person, 
Um, he's he, in some ways, I don't necessarily think the way that he was written was vilified, but um, he definitely wasn't like a warm person. Um, he, he was just king of the underworld and people feared death because it's the unknown. Um, so obviously the thing that you fear becomes evil in most societies. Uh, so I, I just, it's interesting now to have lost someone so close to me and to write constantly about death. <laughs> Um, but I want it to be more than just, you know, this is the god of the underworld, you know, I, I, it means a lot more to me. And I had never thought that I would have people reaching out to me to tell me how much my interpretation of the underworld meant to them. But that happens often. And I'm thankful for that. <laughs>